All right, let's talk a little bit more about sequences. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of work with limits of sequences, and mainly we'll remind ourselves about how to use L'Hopital's rule. That's our favorite French mathematician who comes in and makes limits easy if we remember how to actually apply L'Hopital's rule. I suspect that a lot of us remember some about L'Hopital's rule, some of the stuff we need to know, but probably not everything. So I've got a couple of examples that I've picked specifically to go over some of the maybe more complicated details, um, and hopefully that'll serve as a good reminder. Uh, then we're just going to build some terminology to describe sequences because, again, we're familiar with talking about functions. We know how to describe them in words, but we haven't really talked about sequences that much in our history uh, in math so we'll b build up some terminology so that when we talk about sequences we can describe them correctly and accurately and um, efficiently I guess uh, then I've got a specific type of sequence a geometric sequence that's going to be really important for us we'll talk about that I got a couple of quick basic results and then finally we'll talk about growth rates at the very end so a lot of topics in this video limits here we go um, we talked before about how we can essentially treat a, a sequence kind of like a function, but re remember that the domain is actually just the natural numbers, um, not including zero, depending on how you define the natural numbers. So we restrict the domain to just these positive integers, one, two, three, mostly. That's mostly what we'll use for the index. Um, so it, it takes in some sort of an index, and it spits out some sort of a, a term value uh, if we can define it explicitly that way. So if we can treat a sequence like a function that takes in this input and spits out an output, then that means that most of our intuition about limits uh, is going to still work. So specifically, we're only caring about the limit as n goes to infinity, which is good news for us. Um, we're just we're going to restrict ourselves to thinking about that specific limit. But all the limit laws that we've talked about in Calc 1 are still going to hold. That means the, the limit of a sum is still the sum of the limits. You can split things into two terms, find the limits individually, and add or subtract them back together. Same thing with products. If you have a sequence uh, that's multiplied by some other sequence, or if your rule for a sequence looks like it's really a product of things, split it into two separate things, find the limits individually, and multiply them together. We can divide things using limits still easily. Limit in the numerator, limit in the denominator. Just make sure you don't divide by zero. All that is still true. And then if you have some sort of a coefficient k, you can factor that right outside of the limit this way as long as k is actually a constant. So coefficients can get factored out. None of these are new. This is all just regurgitating limit laws from Calc 1 because we're able to make this connection to functions. So what I want to do is spend our time remembering L'Hopital's rule. Pause the video. See if you can work these things out. Remember, uh, what we care about with all of these is a limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n in each case. So each of these rules for the sequence, see if you can find this limit as n goes to infinity. See if you can shake off some of the rest, and then I'll kind of catch us up when we come back. So go ahead and pause that. I'm going to erase this while it's paused. If you haven't paused it, pause it. Okay, here we go. Let's just do this. Um, so we're going to consider the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over the square root of n. And you might recognize that this is going to be 1 over this infinitely large thing because our denominator is going to get huge. That's going to go to 0. In Calc 1, you might have called this 1 over x to the 1 half. Now, we're not going to use x anymore. We're using n for our input. But this is a reciprocal power function. And you might remember that the n behavior of reciprocal power functions is always 0. Neat. In this one, you can do this in a couple of different ways. You could either say, well, you've got polynomials here. So we really just care about the biggest terms of these. Because when we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of this whole polynomial on top, over this whole polynomial on the bottom. You might remember that this is just the same thing as those two biggest terms divided by each other. And then we just have 8 fifths here, and we can kind of go from there. Limit as n goes to infinity of 8 fifths, which is just 8 fifths. Uh, or if you wanted, if you didn't remember that, you could just use L'Hopital's rule. You could say, all right, this is infinity over infinity, so this will be a limit as n goes to infinity of the derivative of the top. That's 24n squared over the derivative of the bottom. That's 15n squared plus 3. 
and then you've got L'Hopital's rule again. And so you could say, all right, this is the limit as n goes to infinity of 48n over 30n, which is really just 48 over 30. And 48 over 30 is 8 fifths. So hey, same thing. Uh, whether you're thinking about this as just a polynomial or using L'Hopital's rule, that's fine. I don't really care. Uh, I switch colors when I do L'Hopital's rule just to show us what we're doing here. So that's where I'm differentiating everything. Uh, anyways, this last one, we've got a limit as n goes to infinity of 4n cubed over e to the n. And then we'll use L'Hopital's rule on this because, remember, we're getting infinity over infinity. I should probably write that at least. Uh, so we'll say this is the limit as n goes to infinity of 12n squared over e to the n. That's my derivative of the top and derivative of the bottom. I'll have to do it again. 24n over e to the n. And let me do it one more time. I'm going to run out of colors eventually. 24 over e to the n. And my exponential is still going to go to infinity. So we have a kind of similar case as to what we had up here in this first problem, where the denominator is going to go to infinity. You could think this is really like 24 over infinity. So our limit is going to go to 0. So we've got that this first sequence counts towards 0. Our second sequence counts towards 8 fifths. And our third sequence counts towards 0 just by doing these limits. No big deal. Here's two more. And these ones are trickier. For this one, this first one, number 4, uh, if we look at this, you'll notice that when n goes to infinity, this thing goes off to infinity, but the sine business goes to sine of 0, which is 0. So we have infinity times 0, which is an indeterminate form. So what we're going to have to do is remind ourselves how L'Hopital's rule works on something like this. And in the second one, you'll notice, similarly, we have this indeterminate form that's going to look like infinity raised to the zero. And we got to figure out how does this actually work? How do we deal with these things? So that's what I want to focus our time on mainly. Let me get rid of this. Let me get rid of this. And instead of writing it out as that limit of our product, I'll write it this way first. You might remember that since L'Hopital's rule always works really nicely with quotients, we might want to rewrite this as a limit of a fraction. So instead of calling this thing n squared times sine of pi over n, I'm going to call this sine of pi over n divided by 1 over n squared. Now. I've got a fraction. It's the exact same thing. Multiplying by a fraction is the same thing as um, dividing by the reciprocal. So I'm thinking like this is n squared over 1 that I'm multiplying, and so I'm dividing by 1 over n squared. And now what you'll notice is that our numerator goes to 0, and our denominator goes to 0 as well as n goes to infinity. So we can apply L'Hopital's rule to this by differentiating. So we need to find the derivative of the top. We're going to have to do the chain rule on this. It might be nice to think about this really as kind of like a sine of pi n to the negative 1. And maybe we'll think of this as n to the negative 2. So anyways, when we do the chain rule, our derivative of the sine function is going to be the cosine function. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside part. And that's going to be negative pi n to the negative 2. So I'll call this negative pi over n squared. That's the chain rule on my numerator. And now the derivative of the denominator is going to be negative 2 n to the negative 3. I'll just call that negative 2 over n cubed. Now before I try and evaluate this limit because it looks really ugly, I'll just do some algebra to simplify all this stuff. What that really is is the limit as n goes to infinity of this cosine pi over n. I've got a negative. Um, oh, I might need a bit more room here. So I've got a negative pi, and I'm going to flip this n cubed up into the numerator. So I'll call it negative pi n cubed cosine pi over n. And then in my denominator, I have this negative 2 and this n squared of the denominator of the numerator. There we go. Cool. Now I can see some n's and things like that are going to cancel out. And this limit really 
is a limit as n approaches infinity of n pi cosine pi over n over 2. I can try and figure out what happens as n goes to infinity. This part here is going to go off to infinity. Cosine of pi over n is going to go to cosine of 0. And notice that that is going to be 1. Well, I'll write it cosine of 0, which is 1. So this is going to be like pi times 1 times infinity over 2, or pi over 2 times infinity. But that's just infinity. So this sequence diverges. Interesting. All right, let's do this one, and we'll see if we can remember how L'Hopital's rule works for these weird exponential ones. We, again, want to force things to look like a, a quotient. And so what we're going to do is try and force it actually to look like a product like this one did, because then we can use this nice trick where we write it as a quotient by dividing by a reciprocal instead. The way that we take an exponential and turn it into a product is by using a logarithm. So we'll say this limit of 2n to the 1 over n is really equal to the limit, as n goes to infinity, of e to the natural log 2n to the 1 over n. Exponentials and logs cancel each other out. They're inverses of each other, so we're allowed to compose them this way. And this is really a limit as n goes to infinity of e 1 over n natural log of 2n. There's this beautiful property of logarithms that we have that says that we can bring this out front. So that's really the reason we're using this log, is so that we can turn this exponential here into this product. Now, because of the continuity of the exponential function, this limit of the exponential of all this stuff is really the same thing as e raised to the limit. We can essentially put the limit up in the exponent. And what we're going to do is just focus on this. So I probably need another page on here to really do this. Let's see. I don't want to do that. Let me insert a new page here. All right, cool. So let's just take a look at this limit here. Uh, it was, I'll do it in green, the limit as n goes to infinity of the natural log of 2n over n, I think. Yeah, it's a 1 over n, but I'm just going to put it into that fraction. So again, notice that because of this exponent being 1 over n, when we were multiplying, it really does turn into a fraction. If it didn't turn into a fraction right away, we'd probably use a similar trick that we did up in this number 4 one, where we turned this n squared multiplication into a division by 1 over n squared. We already had multiplication by 1 over n, so it already is division, so we're good. Notice our log goes off to infinity. And so does this denominator. So, bang, we're allowed to use L'Hopital's rule on this thing. So we have to find the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of the top is going to be 1 over 2n times 2. That's the chain rule. And the derivative of the bottom is 1. So what we really have is that this thing is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n. These 2s in the numerator and denominator cancel out division by 1, this thing, you'll notice, goes to 0. Now, that's not our actual limit of the sequence. Remember, that's just the limit of this exponent. So what we really have is that the limit as n goes to infinity of 2n to the 1 over n is equal to e raised to the limit as n goes to infinity of this natural log of 2n over n, and that was the thing that we said was 0. So this sequence actually counts towards 1. Cool. So that's what we have going on with something like this. Remember L'Hopital's rule. See if you can remind yourself on how that goes. The exponential version and product version, I think, are probably the trickiest to remember. My guess is that for like numbers 2 and 3, you guys are fine with that. But remembering how to do something like this could be a little trickier. All right. Um, let's move on. We want to talk about describing these sequences using just some terminology, some basic words. Um, we like to do this kind of thing in mathematics. So here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about increasing and decreasing sequences. You might remember that for a function, we say that a function is increasing. 
if for x1 less than x2, f of x1 is less than f of x2. Basically, as your x values get bigger, so do your y values. We have a similar type of thing happening for our sequences, but you'll notice we don't need to describe the inputs. We can just use the index and, and n plus 1. So if you have an index, when you go to your next index, your next term in your sequence, each next term is bigger than the one before it. And for decreasing, it's the same kind of thing. Each next term is smaller than the one before it. So terms get bigger, terms get smaller. Cool. We have this other way of describing it as well, non-decreasing and non-increasing. And all this does is it adds the availability that terms could be the same thing. For instance, an increasing sequence might look like 1, 2, 3, etc., etc., etc. A non-decreasing sequence might look like 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. Now, we can't call this strictly increasing because it's not that each term is bigger than the one before it, but at least they don't get smaller. Notice that every increasing sequence is non-decreasing because 2 is greater than or equal to 1 and 3 is greater than or equal to 2. If the term is bigger than the one before it, then it's bigger than or equal to the one before it. So these two are just more general. They allow this option of terms being the same thing from one term to the next. Cool. Uh, we also have these terms monotonic and bounded. Uh, monotonic essentially just means that your sequence goes in one direction. That's it. It's either non-increasing the whole time. So it's either maybe the same and going down or non-decreasing the whole time maybe increasing like that, or maybe uh, it's got a couple points that are the same, but it never decreases. So as long as it's going in one direction, we'll call it monotonic. Something that bounces around like this, where it goes up and then down and then up and then down, changes direction all the time, we wouldn't call that monotonic because it's going to not necessarily be non-increasing the whole time or non-decreasing the whole time. Uh, if a sequence is bounded, then we're just saying that there's some real number, we'll call it m, but it doesn't really matter. Places call it, different places call it different things. There's some real number that's greater than or equal to the absolute value of this. So it could be that your sequence is um, bounded because they're all negative, right? And there's some most negative number, essentially. Um, now, this does not necessarily mean that our sequence converges. Um, as long as it's bounded, because you could have a sequence that does something like this. As if it just bounces back and forth forever, maybe I'll just write out a sequence. Here's a really easy one. This is an easy one to describe, an easy one to write out, and hopefully it's an easy one to see that it's not going to converge. There's not the limit to this thing because this is just going to bounce back and forth forever and ever and ever. We might call this negative 1 to the n. And so a sequence like this, while it's bounded, while there is some boundary on the size of the terms, we could say 1 is the bound because all the terms, the absolute value of them is less than or equal to 1. Um, it's not necessarily going to converge. Boundedness is a really helpful property, though, that we can think of. Um, when we talk about boundedness, sometimes people will mix that up with a limit because they'll think of maybe like uh, a sequence like this, one, half. We talked about this one in another video. And the picture of this sequence ends up looking something like this. Sometimes people will say that's bounded because there's this like asymptote that it's approaching. That's not what we really mean here. We just mean it's not going off to infinity or negative infinity. There is some sort of a cap on the size of the values. That's what we mean by bounded. So pause the video, take a minute, and uh, maybe write out some of the terms of these sequences and see if you can describe them using the words that we've got. Um, all three of them are relatively similar, but there are some differences. So are they bounded? Are they increasing or decreasing? Or you could say non-decreasing or non-increasing. Um, are they monotonic? That kind of thing.
All right, so this is what I've got. I just wrote out a bunch of the terms, and then I also drew uh, the sequences a little bit. I drew this green line on each of them at three, just so we can see a little bit better about what's happening. So here our sequence starts at four, and then it's uh, three plus a half, three plus a third, three plus a quarter, etc., etc., etc. Same thing, but it's three minus a half, three minus a third, three minus a fourth, etc. And then this one, we have this weird kind of bouncing back and forth. So Hopefully, just by looking at this, we can see that this first one is, let me grab this. We can hopefully see that this is decreasing, or if you want, you could say it's non-increasing. Uh, it also is monotonic. It's going down uh, forever. It doesn't ever go up. And you could say this is bounded. Uh, it's bounded above we could say by four, and sometimes people will talk about bounded below. Uh, so you could say it's bounded above by four and below by three. Um, but most of the time, all we care about is the fact that it's bounded. And so we don't really care too much about what the smallest terms are. We really just care about what the maximum size of the terms are. So mostly we really just care about this above part. Um, in this case, uh, or at least, yeah, yes, that's how I'll leave it. Um, with the second one, we can say it is increasing, or if you want, you could say it's non-decreasing, same kind of thing. It's only doing that, so it's monotonic. Uh, it is also bounded. Um, we could say above by three, below by two. So our biggest terms are always going to be less than or equal to 3. Notice that we'll never actually get to 3, but they'll always be less than or equal to 3. And then our smallest terms are um, greater than or equal to 2. But most of the time, we really just care about the one bound. Uh, for something like this, we'll say that it's not really monotonic at all because it's oscillating. We'll hopefully get used to seeing that negative 1 to the n thing and notice that that's telling us that it's oscillating. This is bounded. It's bounded above by 7 halves. Oops, I'm having a hard time writing. There we go. Uh, and it's bounded below by 2. Our biggest term here is 7 halves. Our smallest term is 2. So that's what we've got. Uh, maybe I'll just circle the terms that we're looking at for those bounds. And then in this one, we're also looking at those kind of like asymptotic behaviors. Uh, and then in that last one, we'll say here's our smallest term and here's our biggest term. So that's how we can describe these three sequences. Hopefully that's a helpful thing uh, for us to kind of think through and talk through. Um, I want to talk about a geometric sequence. A uh, geometric sequence is just a sequence in a very specific form. This geometric form that we'll call here, it's a r to the n, where a is a coefficient. Obviously, we don't want it to be zero, or else it's super boring. Um, and r is a ratio. It's just a fixed ratio between terms. So we might have something like 2, 4, um, 8, 16, dot, dot, dot. Um, we also saw oops, where each term here is being doubled. Uh, we also saw that one where um, it was something like this. It was the reciprocals of that. Now, we were looking at the series that was based on this, so we'll talk about geometric series a little later on. But here we just have like this constant ratio. R is 2 in this case, and this one r is half, we just keep multiplying by a half over and over and over again. Um, so that's what a geometric sequence is. And what we really care about is whether these things converge or not. Uh, and hopefully it should be pretty easy for us to tell what's going on. We'll just think about what happens if the size of r is small, if we have something like a half. Well, we can go back to this example and hopefully see, I should probably throw the old dot dot dots on there, uh, we'll hopefully see that this thing is counting down towards zero. As you raise fractions that are small to higher exponents, you're really dividing, right? And so this is really a lot of division that we have. And so when you do that kind of repeated division over and over and over again, we're going to count towards zero no matter what. 
Uh, if r is equal to 1, then this sequence is a really boring one. It's just 1 times, uh, not times, sorry. It's 1 and then 1 squared and then 1 cubed and then 1 to the fourth. But that's just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So it's constant. And then we'll notice that if r is really big, we have this thing going to blow up and get really large. And so it'll count up towards infinity. And if r is negative 1 or less than negative 1, then we'll do a similar kind of thing except we have this oscillation. Um, we have these like, maybe we could say like negative 2 to the n. Um, that's going to give us, if we did like this sequence here, that's going to give us a sequence of negative 2, 4, negative 8, etc. And we'll see that the signs keeps flipping. And so we don't want to say it like always is going to go towards infinity or to negative infinity because in a lot of these they'll oscillate back and forth. So again, this is what we're saying here. If r is greater than zero, it's monotonic. But if it's less than zero, uh, if it's negative, it's going to be oscillating. So we'll just keep an eye on that. So those are our geometric sequences. Um, here's some basic results that we can just kind of hammer out. We can use the squeeze theorem still. So if you have like a weird sequence that looks like... Um, I don't know, I'll just say like sine of uh, pi over n over n squared. Oh, no, I'll just say sine of n. How about we'll just do that? Sine of n over n squared. Uh, as n goes to infinity, this is hard to deal with. It's going to bounce between negative 1 and 1. And so you could use the squeeze theorem, right? Bound it above by 1 over n squared, below by negative 1 over n squared. And then you can go ahead and do a whole bunch of stuff. So we'll still be able to use the squeeze theorem here. I should probably say b sub n because it's this middle one that we care about, the one in between. Um, remind yourself about squeeze theorem from Calc 1 if you need to. Uh, this is a really important theorem that we won't prove or anything like that, but it's pretty easy um, to prove it if you want. Uh, basically, if your sequence is bounded and monotonic, then we know it converges cool um we will use that later on you'll find that there'll be a couple of times where we'll be playing with some weird sequence and we'll have kind of in our back pocket that it's bounded and so we just have to show that it's monotonic and then we'll know it converges or maybe vice versa maybe we know it's monotonic and we just have to show that it's bounded and then we'll know it converges so that's something that we'll kind of refer back to and then lastly, we have this idea of growth rates. Um, you might remember doing something like this in Calc 1 where you compare function growths, um, where you can kind of see uh, what these things look like compared to each other. Normally, we'd use L'Hopital's rule to compare growth rates. Like normally, we could say something like this one. I don't remember exactly what I had, but let's just do like n squared over e to the n. We had an example like this earlier in this slide set. And we did L'Hopital's rule a couple of times, but what we could notice is that, like, okay, I know this is going to go to zero because I know that this exponential function grows way faster than this power function. And so I know this thing is going to go to infinity really quickly. And so we see that in L'Hopital's rule when we differentiate, right? You differentiate this numerator and you get 2n. You differentiate the denominator, you get e to the n. You differentiate the numerator again and you get 2 you differentiate the denominator and you still get e to the n. So the derivatives kind of show off that difference in growth rates that we have. Now, the problem with sequences is that sometimes we'll end up with things like factorials. Um, just as a reminder, 3 factorial is like 3 times 2 times 1. And so you can have things like n factorial. Since we're just taking in these integer values, um, we can use this factorial function and not have to worry about this like gamma function thing that I've been talking about. Since we're just taking in positive integers for our index, that'll work. But I don't know how to differentiate this thing. So knowing this list of growth rates is really helpful. Um, this is supposed to say slowest growth. There we go. Um, knowing this list of growth rates is really helpful. So if I've got like a weird sequence that's like a sub n is n factorial times n squared over um, n to the n, then I automatically know that this thing is going to count towards zero because there's this n to the n in the denominator, and I know this little tower function thing uh, grows way faster than everything else. And so I know that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is 0 because of that denominator going to infinity really quickly. So use this chart if you want. We'll try and appeal to this idea of growth rates later on when we need to, but hopefully that's a pretty helpful rundown of sequences.